All right, I think we will turn the page here to a terrible story that I think I had not heard of until recently, even though it, it stems from 2019. It's the murder of Michael Dean in Temple, Texas, just shot by the police. Terrible murder. There is a trial now of the guy Carmen DeCruz, the cop who killed him ongoing in Texas. And we are very, very happy to be joined as we continue the show by the civil rights attorney, Lee Merritt. Mr. Merritt, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me and for telling Michael Dean's story. No, absolutely. And I wanted to just start there. Uh, I think many people, including myself, I had just I found this out actually from following you uh, a couple weeks ago, looking at your feed. Um, what happened to Michael Dean in 2019 and, and what exactly is the state of where we are with the trial right now? On December 2nd of 2019, Michael Dean went out to buy his six year old daughter a birthday cake. It was her sixth birthday. Uh, and he never made it home. He was pulled over during a traffic stop and for a very long time, for three years really, uh, the family was kind of given a black box about what he happened. They said he got into an altercation with law enforcement and that he was shot in his face. Um, they weren't told exactly what happened. My, my office actually asked that they preserve the vehicle because we can reconstruct a shooting based on you know, bullet patterns, blood splatter, et cetera. They washed the car down with blood um, I'm sorry, they washed the car down with bleach mm. uh, before they returned it to us, destroying evidence. And we just learned that this officer now claims that he accidentally shot Michael Dean in the face uh, when he was hailing him during a traffic stop. Wow. I mean, the but of course, he was shot in the face at point blank range, which is just insane to think about, like, how that could be an accident. Um, and right. Yeah, I mean— yeah, those, those weapons, uh, the 9 millimeter Glock carried by law enforcement in Temple requires seven pounds of, of trigger resistance. That means mm -hmm. you have to intentionally pull that trigger in order to do so. There's a trigger safety guard on the gun itself. The idea that this was an accident is really absurd, but that is what his defense team is trying to prove at trial now. And so this happened, though, in Bell County, Texas, which is was a, well, is a sundown town. Can you explain the significance of that and how that could have some relation to, to what took place a couple of years ago sure. with Michael Dean? Sure. A sundown town historically is a place where African-Americans are not welcome after sundown. They're best advised to stay home after sundown. Bell County is, is actually really popular now for another case that me and Grassroots Law Project is involved in where a young man shot a police officer who was coming through his window during a no-knock raid. Uh, that raid ended up being on the wrong home in the same county. And the reason I bring it up is that man has been in prison for the last 10 years waiting for trial. In an American judicial system, we have someone who's in prison for the last decade without actually being convicted of any crime whatsoever. That's Bell County. That's Bell County today in Texas. I mean, it's, you know, amazing on so many levels, really. Uh, and, and it speaks to the issue of the, you know, the sort of propaganda it is. I think in front of the courthouse, there's like a memorial or something like that to fallen officers. And it just seems, you know, how are you supposed to have a fair trial when the courthouse itself is essentially memorializing, you know, those who, you know, have killed Michael Dean. No worries. Because, be, yeah, because I do that work, I get countless calls. There's Patrick Warren Sr., an unarmed man shot in his pajamas, who was shot to death, in, uh, just in Killeen, which is in Bell County. They have this ridiculous memorial to a, a fictional officer. That That's not memorializing an event that actually happened. It's a downed officer uh, to drum up sympathy for law enforcement officers. Um in Texas, uh, just like most of the country, we kill about three people a day. Uh, law enforcement officers, when I say we, because it's taxpayer-sponsored murder, we kill about three people a day uh, through gun violence alone. There's no memorials to those people. There's nothing about Ahmaud Arbery there or Tatiana Jefferson or Botham Zha or all the bodies that we've had to dig through over the past recent history in, uh, in Texas. I'm curious, like, how it's being covered in, in, in media. I'm actually surprised that this case isn't receiving more coverage just because of how, like, blatantly murderous this was. Um, but has it resonated? Like, it hasn't really resonated across the country, as I've seen. But how is it being covered locally? Yeah, well... I have the advantage as a, as a practitioner to represent a bunch of big national cases. And when I try to talk to some of my national media outlet friends about this, they say we need a video. 
Mm-hmm. And the, the Bell County Police Department, a city of uh, Temple, has been very good at obscuring that evidence. Now, we are absolutely entitled to that evidence. The family uh, should have been shown the video or given, um, been provided to their attorneys three years ago so that they could prepare their civil suit so they would know what would ha- what happened to their loved ones. That's the reason those body cam and dash cam videos exist. But even as the trial is ongoing and the tape has been played in open court, we still have not seen that video. Uh, and the Texas Attorney General, Ken Paxton, uh, has repeatedly granted uh, the Bell County prosecutors and the defense attorneys uh, coverage so that they don't have to release that video to our office or to the public in general. Mm. And one of the other factors here is is the charges themselves. I mean, I know that Carmen DeCruz is charged with second degree manslaughter. And I know there's always a discussion sometimes about how, you know, overcharging can be used to sort of let people off. But I mean, this seems to be a case where they just are, are doing the bare minimum in terms of what the actual charges are based on the situation. I don't believe that they plan to charge this officer before my office got involved. We're a big national firm and we weren't going to just let it go away. We were eventually going to see the evidence. Otherwise, I don't even think this officer will be on trial. And yes, they tried. They requested the family. When I say they, the prosecutor for Bell County, um, Henry Garza, I believe, uh, he, he requested the family have a bench trial for a murder case. Uh, instead, we have a diverse jury. The prosecutors who are handling the case are doing a a... a quality job in presenting the evidence, and I do believe that this will lead to a conviction. Uh, however, I do th- believe the appropriate charge was murder. Uh, when Amber Geiger went to jail for the murder of both of them, the argument was, you don't want to overcharge her. But she intentionally caused the death of another human being without a proper justification. She meant to do what she did, and that's murder in the t- under the Texas statute. Uh, Michael Dean should, I'm sorry, uh, Carmen De Cruz should be charged with murder for the for the death of, of um uh, Michael Dean as well. Uh, the facts uh, fit a murder charge. Mm. I'm, I know this is like a strange question. Maybe there's no legal answer to it, but if I'm not mistaken, Texas is a stand your ground state, is it not? So like if a police officer or if police were to do a raid on your home and it's not, the, you're not even the right home, I mean, how would stand your ground not apply? Like how are you supposed to know it's police officers? I don't know if you even have an answer to that, but it's just, I'm curious. It's, like. it's one of those oh, questions yeah, that I get yeah. where the answer is kind of obvious, but it's also, it's not legal, right? Mm. Uh, uh, Mar- Marvin Guy, uh, who was who, who is in prison now waiting for trial for an officer who evaded his home during a non I warrant, was absolutely in the right. And it's a scary thing to say because it was a good officer, I'm sure, who had a beautiful family and community that loved him. Uh, and he was out there doing his job. He was doing it on the wrong home, and he made a mistake. Uh, and Marvin Guy should have benefited from the fact that in the middle of the night, and in a home that he was committing no crimes in, someone burst through his window. And he had a weapon nearby, just like a Tatiana Jefferson, when she was standing there. And I'm sorry, so many names, but that's a young woman who was shot playing video games with her nephew. And we just had a murder trial there. And the, the defense there was, well, she was armed in her home when you were creeping around her backyard. And similarly, it just doesn't, the, the, the short answer to your question is it doesn't apply the same when the actor who uh, uses a firearm to protect themselves is an African-American. It just doesn't work that way in Texas. You know, and it speaks to, I think, almost like a deeper narrative issue here. I mean, even having people in the media say, oh, well, we need a video. It's almost as if the narrative in this is, is despite all of the names, despite all of, this, uh, of, the, of the situations we've seen, that somehow you, the burden is still on the victim to prove that they were not murdered in an unjustified way. And it feels like that's a big problem in a lot of these cases is the perception is still so skewed towards uh, uh, law enforcement. That, that's exactly it. And the truth is, we, the public, we don't need a video. We don't need another video of an officer murdering an unarmed black person in order to understand the problem. The, the, the reason the media needs a video, uh, and, the, and often we need video for justice, uh, is because unless there is a national outcry, protest, and demands, and, orga- and, and intense organizing like we've seen since George Floyd, uh, then things will generally continue as business as usual uh, and not providing the video and covering this up and hoping it goes away is generally how things are done in places like Temple, Texas. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wanted to ask you, sorry, I, Eugene, I don't know if you wanted to follow up with something. Mm-mm. No, no, no. 
Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask you something on like a national level. I mean, you know, after the protest with George Floyd in 2020, there was this, um, I guess, sentiment that swept the country that obviously we needed some sort of police reform. And I know that this did happen in 2019, but you said you're working on other cases, cases nationally as well. And I'm just curious if you think anything has changed since uh, 2020 and since we did have like a massive uprising across the country, because we do know that last year was tw- or 2022 was, I believe, like the highest number ever recorded of police killings across the U.S. And I, I mean, police killing people, just to clarify. And, and, and that's what's changed. It's gotten worse. Uh, the problem of policing in America, the deadliest police culture in the modern world, has gotten worse since the murder of George Floyd. Law enforcement as a community has responded to the national outcry and demands for change by doubling down on violence and brutality. And this is not just rhetoric, as you pointed out. The numbers just simply bear that out. Uh, and when, when, when engaged in conversations with police unions and officers, and I've, I've been able to have those conversations in the Trump White House and in the Biden White House, each time they, they still rely on the fact uh, they, I'm sorry, they're still relying on the defense of qualified immunity until we remove qualified immunity as a shield for police officers. And that's a judicially created shield that doesn't even allow us to hold police officers accountable in most cases. Uh, and, and, and until we continue, the backlash to the defund the police movement was, you know, you're going to cause chaos and anarchy and it, it emboldened you know, far right wing conservatives to empower law enforcement officers throughout the country, particularly in the South, but really throughout all 50 states to double down on violence. Mm. And I believe Mr. Dean's family, if I'm not mistaken, was actually at that White House meeting that Trump called, I remember, to talk about these reforms. And it just feels like we keep hearing like someone's going to do something and, and we don't see it. But for those who are just first hearing about Michael Dean's case uh, now, Mr. Merritt, what uh, are is the family and others calling on people to do to, to help bring more awareness? Well, what we have found in other cases uh, and through our meetings with White, uh, the White House and the and, uh, the federal government is that we need federal oversight. We believe that Michael Dean will be convicted probably by the end of the week. I'm sorry, Carmen Dick Cruz will be convicted probably by the end of the week for the murder of Michael Dean. Mm. And he may get, and, he, and he's qualified to get probation. And that's mm. his, his, the likely consequence for the murder of this 26 year old unarmed man. And so we are asking for the Department of Justice, particularly the Civil Rights Division under the leadership of Kristen Clark, uh, to file criminal federal criminal charges against Mike, uh, against Carmen Cruz uh, so that there's that additional safety net so that he actually faces a real consequence. Mm-hmm. And we're asking other people to join us in that demand. Mm-hmm. Right on. Well, Lee Merritt, civil rights attorney, always appreciate you being willing to join us. And thank you for all your work to bring this case to light here. And uh, thanks also for just giving us some of your time here in the Freedom Side. Sure thing. Thank you all so much for having me. Be blessed. Mm-hmm. Anytime.